Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, it's Friday, February 17th. We will wrap this week. We'll focus on what we learned over the last five trading days. Yesterday's session on Thursday really accelerating to the downside into the close. Today, nice recovery, although choppy, dribbling into this weekend. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Everyone. Welcome to the final bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at stockcharts.com in a cloudy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the best practices of technical analysis. The technical toolkit is really driven off of the analysis of price and investor behavior as reflected in price action. I was taught to look at price, breadth, and sentiment. I think of them in that priority uh, order. When you look at prices here, you've had a nice recovery off of the October lows, undeniable. You've also seen some short-term weakness. You've seen some uh, overextended conditions as stocks are overbought, like Meta and Tesla and others, some of those emerging growth names as well. Brief pullback here through the course of this week. We'll see what how we did relative to that key level of 4,100. The S&P actually getting below there today uh, and uh, yesterday as well. Let's get to our Wrap the Week segment. I do want to start with a poll. We have a poll running at all times on our live stream page at uh, stockcharts.com. Also on our social media accounts. So follow us on Twitter. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. You won't miss another poll. We asked you recently, which of the FANG stocks performs best over the next three months? Meta, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Alphabet. The number one answer, 32% of you, about one in three answered Meta. I'm actually surprised a bit by this, and I'll tell you why. Apple, probably the best setup, maybe. I don't know if I want to answer the question for you, but Apple has a pretty decent setup here in terms of strength when others have been struggling a little bit. Meta is one of those gappy names that so far has dribbled uh, lower. You know, just really quickly looking at the chart of Meta, I had a really good conversation yesterday with uh, Sean McLaughlin of All Star Charts. We looked at this stock in particular. It certainly could recover and go up from here. I think the challenge is the weakness having broken down through the upper end of that gap around 180. Now we're kind of rolling over, close it a little bit higher today, but uh, but overall the weakness off of that gap uh, is a concern. Now, of course, I'm asking for the next three months, which means hopefully you're rightfully not thinking of just this little breakdown, but more of the longer term uh, the longer term time frame. And it's important to think about when you're looking forward looking at a particular time horizon, like one month or three months or one year or beyond, Think about how much time you want to bring into your analysis to have a, a, a good amount to look forward. And, and the reason why I'm saying that is most of my charts are two-year daily charts. And the reason is because I'm usually looking out about one to three, sometimes even six months, usually about that one to three month time frame is kind of the sweet spot of where I'm trying to uh, get a sense of where things are headed, which means you need to bring in a couple of years of data to make sure that you understand where we've come from and, and be better equipped to think about that time frame uh, going forward. So number one was Meta, uh, the number five pick, which of course immediately as a contrarian makes me think, let's look for some bottom fishing opportunities. Amazon, talk about a stock that has continued to fail to get above its 200 day moving average. No love yet on that thesis uh, this week as Amazon making a new swing low here uh, on Friday. Let's continue on our Wrap the Week segment, just looking at the returns today. Then we'll look at the last five trading days, look at the entire week and think about what we learned. So when you look at the S&P 500 down about a quarter of a percent, down below 4,100, you know, yesterday into the close, the last hour I think was indicative because you accelerated to the downside. Now, why do we focus so much on the last hour? Honestly, that's when a lot of institutions will will get to work. They'll tend to be lighter uh, actors during the course of the week. The first 30 minutes usually thought it was more of a retail uh, time in the market because there's a lot of retail uh, trades that come right out of the open. Things settle down around lunchtime and quite off the volumes dry up. But then in the afternoon, that is when institutions who are not trying to shock the market have a lot of volume to move in and out of different names. We usually wait till the end of the day. So looking at the last hour of trading, a lot of times can be a little more informative about what institutions may be doing. Certainly more of a sense of profit taking into the close yesterday. 
today think about what this means, right? We rallied after lunch, kind of moved higher and higher until the three o'clock hour, again, when the institutions start participating and we stalled out. That was the high for the day. So I think the, the message through the course of this week, generally speaking, probably institutions weakening uh, position or lightening positions. If I if I would summarize again, that's a broad generalization, but that's how I would tend to think of it. Uh, the NASDAQ, by the way, down about 0.6%. Small caps actually finished in the green, as did the Dow, but most of our benchmarks were lower. The VIX is back below 20 today. Interest rates actually started the day much higher and they gapped higher from yesterday's close, but through the course of the day, bond prices rallied and interest rates came off. Tenure yield finishing a little bit lower than yesterday, around 383. Long bond yields a little bit higher at 389. The dollar index, again, not much change. And it's interesting, that dollar index is so crucial. I was doing an interview earlier today with uh, Miss Schneider of Market Gauge, who was on my show uh, earlier this week. I think that was on Tuesday's show. And we talked a lot about the dollar uh, index, uh, among other among other things. And, and just thinking about the strength or weakness in the dollar as such an important driver of all the other things we may consider as uh, strategists. Commodities, nice move higher for gold. And look at these strange days you've had the last two days on the uh, on the GLD, kind of opening lower, ripping higher, and then kind of rolling over into the close. You had almost the exact same uh, contour to the day today. Lower at the open, moving higher into the afternoon, but sort of uh, lightening up a little bit. But overall, still up about a third of a percent silver and copper prices all finishing in the green as well. Cryptocurrencies, it appears to be all bullish. And I and I don't say that lightly. Uh, I will tell you that the most important thing, right, the most bullish thing that a chart can do is go up. And what I have to recognize is Bitcoin came up to 25,000 uh, yesterday, sold off uh, as equities did. And then you can see another rally here uh, recently through the course of the day today. Came off a little bit going into the equity close, but still Bitcoin up about another 5% today. Uh, closing just below 25,000, touched it just recently. And that 25,000 level is actually a level of resistance from uh, from earlier in uh, actually late 2022. We'll get to that chart here in a minute uh, if we can. Uh, but overall, nice move higher across the board in the top 10 cryptocurrencies that we track. Uh, let's look at the wrap of the week chart. This would be this one right here. So we're going to start looking at the last uh, five trading days. We start the clock on last Friday session. We take it to today. And you can see the S&P, a negative week. It was a positive for the week through Thursday's close, even though Wednesday to Thursday was kind of a big gap. We went negative for the week as of today, and that's down about a quarter of a percent. Number of things underperformed the S&P this week. This is emerging markets, bond prices, and gold, all right around 1.1% down for the week. The worst performer, crude oil prices. This is using the USO, which is a bullish uh, crude oil ETF, down about 4%. Everything else outperformed the S&P was, and was indeed uh, positive for the week. The dollar, along with uh, the NASDAQ 100, both up about 0.4%. In purple, we have small cap stocks. Finished the week up 1.4%. As I mentioned, small caps actually gained today a little bit, while uh, large and mid caps were down. That might be an important thing to uh, remember. Now, where's Bitcoin? Well, I took it off because all the other returns were compressed when you added when you uh, added Bitcoin to the list. But it had indeed a strong week for cryptocurrencies, with Bitcoin up uh, almost fourteen percent from last Friday's close. Let's actually start there and look at the chart of Bitcoin and see what we can uh, find here. This is on my inner market uh, analysis checklist or uh, chart list. And what's interesting about the chart of uh, Bitcoin, again, I was talking with Mitch Schneider about this particular chart earlier today. Um, a shout out to Jared Blickery on uh, Yahoo Finance, but a really good conversation, uh, which should be out uh, pretty soon, I think early next week. Uh, we we're talking about a number of different things. One of the charts we focused on was uh, Bitcoin, and we were both asked to sort of weigh in on what we saw. And, and I would say, you know, my, my, my first answer would be just look at the trend, right? Take a step back and think about what you see when you connect the highs and the lows. Charles Dow taught us in the early 1900s, really late 1800s, uh, of the importance of trends and focusing on the highs and the lows. Through November of last year, we kept making lower lows, and we would have a number of times where we made a new swing high, and then we'd fail and break down through trend line support. Look at all these green trend lines that highlight those little bounces and then failures, a bounce higher and a failure, You know, breaking to a new swing high but failing to hold it. That now all looks sort of different over the last couple of months. Now we've seen a higher low in December. We've seen another higher low in February. And look at that breakout level. It's right around 21,500, 22,000. Look at the resistance in November. We broke above it in January. We pulled back and tested it from above in February and now rotating higher. 
We're right at the August 2022 high. Similar to on the S&P 500, we talk about S&P 4300, which would be the August peak. Bitcoin has actually reached its August peak this week. And the question I would argue over the course of this long holiday weekend when equities are closed and bonds are closed, Bitcoin's open, right? And so let's see if it's actually able to power above that level. I've seen enough at this point to think more positive than negative. And I think the trend has reversed when you look at the price movements its treatment of uh, support and resistance levels, but very importantly, the shift in momentum, which has clearly shifted from a bearish phase to more of a bullish phase. Just to finish up our wrap the week segment, looking at the sector movements, defense over offense, very much a theme today with uh, the defensive sectors of consumer staples, utilities, both up over 1% today. Now, this is a little different than what we've seen recently. We've seen some of these defensive sectors struggle a little bit to, to make uh, headway on the upside. Uh, today, staples over discretionary, clearly, right? That's that's sort of a, a different look than what we've seen really off of the October lows when uh, offense in the form of consumer discretionary has been dramatically outperforming uh, consumer staples. Today, staples, utilities, healthcare, uh, all in the uh, in the green. Uh, sectors that were underperforming and really lagging the benchmarks, energy, and we highlighted E&P stocks. That stands for exploration and production. These would be things like DVN, FANG, um, others like that, Apache. Uh, these are uh, en- uh, exploration and production names. Most of them, if not all of them, uh, breaking down through support, struggling uh, while the rest of the market has been uh, thriving. Technology next uh, from the bottom of the list, and then material. So again, some offensive things I would traditionally think as offense in this point in the cycle, uh, all underperforming, defense really, uh, really outperforming. So very much a risk off feel to the tape today. Having said that, there are always charts somewhere that are working. And what's really interesting about analyzing the markets right about now is you're in the middle of earnings season as well. We're kind of wrapping up through earnings season, but a chart like uh, uh, John Deere comes to mind. AutoNation is another one. Um, These are charts that are actually working just fine. I did a note earlier this week for my market misbehavior premium members. We focused a little bit on auto parts, auto retailers, things like AutoNation and other names like this, you know, breaking out of bases, pulling back. So today's gap, nice surprise to the upside on an earnings beat uh, before the open today. But what I'm impressed with is the setup going into the earnings release today. The reason why I would have confidence going into the day today is this 130, 135 level. That's where we hit resistance in October of 21. Look at the number of times we tested that range from below. Finally broke above it and retested it from above. That's a classic breakout and retest setup, setting up for uh, the last couple of days, which were closing toward the high. So the gap higher today, I think, is just the latest in a series of moves that have been uh, fairly constructive there. So friendly reminder to be friendly with the scanning engine, with the alert tool on stockcharts.com. We can help you identify names like this hopefully before they gap up 11%, but certainly identifying some of the names on the move so you can evaluate whether or not it's the right time to take action today. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back answering your questions from the final bar mailbag. We'll see you in a minute. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. It's a pleasure to do this show for you every day. We have a really good team uh, helping us do so, and we are testing our new studio. We're super excited to share with you the new format of The Final Bar coming very, very soon. A lot of good things to come through the course of uh, this year for sure. A couple quick announcements before we go to The Final Bar mailbag. First off, all of those questions come from people like you over the last couple of days. Please keep the great questions coming. We'll do more mailbag segments in the coming weeks. You can get your questions to us via email, the final bar at stockcharts.com, via Twitter at final bar SCTV is our handle there. And we're on YouTube. Just go to the Stock Charts YouTube channel, drop a question below the video you're watching. We're going to hope to answer one of yours live on the air next week. Upcoming schedule, we had three really good guests uh, this week. A lot of fun uh, talking with Sean McLaughlin, uh, Ms. Schneider, uh, Greg Harmon on Wednesday. It was a lot of fun as well. Next week, we have the holiday on Monday, but we actually recorded a special episode. Three different experts, myself, Grayson Rose, Greg Schnell, are all going to share with you how we have our stock charts account set up, particularly focused on the chartless feature, how to set them up and arrange them, how to use them, how to leverage them to make sense of other parts of the site as well. It's all about the chartless and tune in on Monday for that special episode. 
Three guests for you next week on Tuesday, Danielle Shea of Simpler Trading. On Wednesday, the 22nd, Dave Landry of DaveLandry.com. Thursday, the 23rd, Louis Giannis, a wealth manager at WealthNet Advisors, coming to us from Colorado. Also, I wanted to let you know about an upcoming free webcast with uh, my own firm called Market Misbehavior. Next Tuesday, right after the long holiday weekend, I'll be doing an event called Five Favorite Breath Indicators. That's on Tuesday, the 21st at one o'clock Eastern. I will share with you the five breath indicators I follow the most. We'll talk about how they're constructed. We'll look at some historical buy and sell signals and then focus on what they're telling us about the market conditions today. A couple have registered sell signals recently that I think are important to consider when you're looking at the equity environment. You can sign up for that free event next Tuesday at marketmisbehavior.com slash breadth. Let's continue on our show today with the final bar mailbag. Keep your great questions coming. Let's share with you some of the questions we've received recently. Here's question number one. How can I take some of the charts from the lists you review daily and add them to one of my chart lists? It's a really good question. So I will share with you a couple different things, right? It depends on what you're talking about. Um, so I'd say first off, the uh, chart list that I talk about a lot on uh, my show is called the Market, uh, the Mindful Investor Live chart list. The way you can get to that is go to the articles tab at the top of our website, go to my blog, which is called the mindful investor. And at the very top, you will see a gray button that says live chart list. Now, the way that we've designed this, a group of us, a small group of contributors have the ability to share chart lists and create URLs that you can all access. Now, and they're mainly people like, like me that write for stock charts and, and, uh, and have the need to share some of these lists with you. If you go here, this list is actually updated by me. So if I make any changes to these charts, they're going to be reflected uh, on this list. And so it's a good one to bookmark because uh, this one in particular, the daily chart of the S&P, I'm always moving things around, adding notes, adding trend lines, you know, highlighting things that I think are important. So, you know, understanding where I'm looking at, the way to do it is by uh, is by just, uh, you, you know, save this as a bookmark, come back to this list of charts, and you'll see my latest thinking as noted with the annotations. But if you want to make it your own, you can click where it says save to chart list. You can actually create this chart list in your own account. Then you have your own copies. You are welcome to take these charts, tweak them, move them around. Around, send them around, whatever you want to do with them. Uh, you be my guest, uh, but uh, it depends on how you want to. How do you want to use those? Now, if you're looking at any of these charts in particular, so if you click through, you can look at the charts individually. All you need to do is say save as, and then it's going to ask you what chart list you want to put it on, and just give it a name. And you can see uh, again the special we have coming up on Monday. We talk all about how to organize your chart list, why I have certain charts uh, chart lists at the top of the list, what the ones at the bottom of my list look like, uh, and and so forth. So. If what I just described does not make sense to you, make sure you tune in on Monday for that special uh, episode. I think it'll help you make sense of how to think about chart lists and manage all these charts that are uh, of meaning to you. Next question. You usually talk about the S&P 500. When should I check the Dow or the NASDAQ instead? And I love this part of your question. Is there a reason for the other indices? So what's funny, uh, my experience coming from an institutional background, what that means is I spent most of my career working for money managers, working at large investment firms, uh, my time at Bloomberg going to trading floors and hedge funds and a lot of larger operations and institutional investors, right? professional uh, investors look at a lot of different benchmarks. I, you would be blown away probably at how much time we spent thinking about index construction and what weighting you would be have exposure to in different indexes. And if you're trying to outperform a benchmark like the Russell 1000 growth index, we would analyze the index uh, to infinity and beyond, trying to make sense of it, looking for nuances, thinking about unintended bets we might be making, thinking about how we want to allocate to sectors, all based on the weighting of those indexes. And we look about a lot about how they were constructed. Um, so here's what I would say. If you look at the front page of our dashboard, there's a reason why we pick these four uh, indexes to, to really reflect the conditions for the U.S. markets. The most important benchmark, if you have to pick one, would be the S&P 500. That is a message I hope to drive home because most institutional investors, you don't talk about the other indexes nearly as much as you talk about the S&P because it is the main benchmark for professional equity money managers, for sure. That's the one you're trying to beat for the most part. Now, the Dow, in terms of its analytical capabilities, in terms of its effectiveness as a benchmark, I would say questionable because it is a it is a group of 30 stocks. It's not a great broad representation of the U.S. markets by any stretch. 
And it actually is a little heavier weighted than other benchmarks to some of the more value oriented parts of the market, like energy or industrials, uh, you know, versus and financials versus the S and P five hundred. Having said that, it's a group of thirty stocks that I've always I've never been disappointed knowing where those thirty stocks are and and looking for comparisons between them. So I think in terms of analyzing the members of the Dow thirty, pretty helpful in terms of its value as a great benchmark reflecting the performance of the equity markets. I would say minimal. Um, it is it is widely quoted. For retail investors, I would say more than anything because it's a number and it's a big number. Um, and also, there's a deep history on the Dow, which is helpful if you're going back to like the early 1900s. A lot of these other benchmarks didn't exist. Brings us to the NASDAQ, which is sort of the new economy, in my opinion. I think the NASDAQ composite and the NASDAQ 100 are good benchmarks to really think about the dominance of technology and uh, communication services and consumer uh, areas of the market. The NYSE composite is the fourth one. This is a good one if you're looking for a the broadest measure of performance of US stocks because it really incorporates all of the 11 S&P sectors and they're all reflected in the NYSE uh, composite. So if I had to look at one, it would be the S&P, but I think all four have value in different times. I'm making a mental note to maybe talk about some of the other ones like the NYSE composite, maybe some of the other benchmarks more than I have. Thanks for that question, by the way. Next one, how can I scan for stocks in a particular sector or industry outperforming a benchmark over a specific time frame? Really good question. And you can do it with the scanning engine. I'll show you the trick that I tend to use. And uh, Bill Shelby is a uh, stock charts developer. He really, I, in, in many ways, designed the, uh, the, the uh, scan engine that you probably are familiar with. I'm going to go to a scan I have, excuse me, called relative something, RS new highs. Here we go. And I'm going to edit the scan and I'll show you the argument that you need. It's this line right here. And, and then it's in brackets, PCT relative, which basically means a relative percent. And there's two parameters, the number of days or periods and the benchmark. So you're saying I want, in this case, I'm saying I want something that has outperformed the S&P 500 looking back to the last 20 trading days. So looking at right now versus 20 days ago, and looking at a ten, at least a ten percent return. This is the, that's what that argument literally makes. So only things that have outperformed the S and P five hundred by ten percent over the last month of trading, essentially. Now, if you run that scan, you'll find it's about twenty eight stocks. You can see them grouped by uh, industry and sector, which is what I normally do. Um, charts like WBD come to mind, right? As a as a stock that had been underperforming for quite some time, now rotating higher. It's hard to tell, but it has indeed outperformed the S and P by ten percent in the last month. Um, month. So this is a really interesting way. This is the best way I've found to do it. It's, it's a very simple uh, look back period. And you can change that, right? So you can change the percent that you're looking at. You can change the number of days and you can certainly change the benchmark as well. So if you want to use something else, an ETF, for example, you can do that as well. But this is a really good way to just look for stocks that have outperformed or underperformed over a certain look back period over a certain time. This is usually my starting point. And then I'll take the list of uh, results and then dig into the charts a little more deeply. Great question there. Next one, I'm blown away at the volume listed on your site since the COVID crash for the NASDAQ composite, the S&P, and the NASDAQ 100. Is the volume accurate? I'm sure you know anything on stock charts is obviously 100% accurate all the time. That's not true. I wish it was, but we have a data team that is doing our best to keep it updated. There will always be little glitches, and we'll do our best to address them. So if you ever see something that looks a little bit wonky when you're looking at uh, stock charts, just shoot an email to our support desk. You can click on the help uh, key at the top of the, of the page and uh, get in touch with them. They're great. They can uh, either help you answer your question and understand it or uh, work with our data team to correct something. I think you're looking at this jump, and this is your chart that you sent me on the NASDAQ composite, and looking at the daily volume. So back here, it's around 10 billion. All of a sudden, it's jumped up to all of this. How can that be true? So the funny part is it actually is accurate. When we talk about the influx of newer investors, we think, talk about the COVID effect and how much uh, retail investors, this new cohort of retail investors, probably had never traded stocks, started opening brokerage accounts, and started trading uh, more actively this is the evidence that that's happening. Those are accurate numbers from the exchanges showing you that the volumes really have increased that much. This is a known issue and a challenge uh, for, for brokerages that are dealing with a bunch of new accounts that are thinking about how to handle all that volume and, and, uh, and, and all of those things. I would say that the question is how much of that uh, volume is sustainable, right? You've had a, a big influx of investors all trading uh, you know, stocks and ETFs and cryptos and all these other things. 
if they start to struggle, right, if you were in that description and you start to have a, a string of negative returns, do you leave and go find another hobby? Uh, maybe, right? But I, I hope not, because I think there's a lot of value to be had in investing. But certainly the volume uh, is an accurate reflection. And no, it does not include volume from ETFs. That's volume on the stocks that comprise the NASDAQ composite. And we get that data right from the exchanges, actually. Final question. In your opinion, what's the probability of the S&P 500 closing below 3,300 on the last trading day of 2023? I, I hate you and love you for that question. I appreciate you asking it. And I will tell you why. Um, I actually put a video on my YouTube channel. My YouTube channel is called Market Misbehavior. Look back. I had a, uh, where do you think the S&P is going to go? Uh, it's a January 2023 update. About once a quarter, I post a video and ask you to think about what I call a probabilistic analysis. And what that means is, don't just think about where you think it's going to go. Think about different scenarios. What's the really bullish scenario? What's the really bearish scenario? What are some scenarios in the middle? Think about what that would look like. Think about what your portfolio would do. Think about what key stocks and benchmarks and sectors would do if those scenarios actually play out. And that just helps you stretch your thinking and break outside of any biases or any assumptions you might be making. So your question is, what's the chance of the S&P closing below 3,300 on the last trading day of 2023? I would say very, very low. I would say 5% would probably be a, a decent thing. I wouldn't I wouldn't say any more than five to ten percent on that. And the reason would be number one, we're in the seasonally strongest part of the year right now. And so usually from October of the, the uh, midterm election year to, uh, you know, June, we'll call it May, June of the uh, pre-election year, which is where we're at now, markets actually tend to be pretty strong. Jeff Hirsch shared a chart like that uh, on our show not too long ago. Um, if that doesn't play out and if the market does start to come down, I'm seeing plenty of evidence of people buying weakness. And so the fact, the, the idea of the S&P getting down to that point, I think is actually relatively low. It was much higher in my mind back in October when we're undercutting 3,600. And, it looks, and the question is, where's the floor? Now that we've made a higher low, now that we're making some traction at this point, I would say the chances are very low. But I would encourage you to answer your question and also think about some alternatives. And uh, then you'll be best prepared for whatever happens. Great questions, folks. We need to wrap the show. Let's go to the three in three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Again, thanks so much to the folks at uh, Yahoo Finance, Jerry Blickery, and also my uh, my co-guest, uh, Ms. Schneider. We had a great conversation earlier today about a lot of different topics focused on technical analysis and routines and uh, really the mindset of how you approach the game of, uh, of trading. One of the things we talked about was AI and the difference between a really compelling long-term thesis versus the short-term price action. John Markman, who's been a contributor to StockCharts.com, he actually was part of our ChartCon uh, event last fall, a fantastic, thoughtful analyst. He wrote a book called Fast Forward Investing. And if you read his book, he talks about some of these big themes that, that again, it's like no doubt that AI will be a driving part of our lives, probably through uh, well beyond when I'm off this earth. However, is it a good investable idea today? Do we know which stocks and which themes will, or in which groups will actually thrive and make money with that theme? I think that's still very much a question mark. In the short term, I love how a chart, a, 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 an ETF like IRBO, which is the iShares AI ETF, I like how it had resistance around 30. It broke above it. Now testing it from above. Can it hold that? If it doesn't, can it hold the 50-day? If so, pretty decent trend with upside potential. If it's failing to hold those levels, I would say AI is a good long-term play, but not necessarily a short-term play. Chart number two is the chart of gold. We're using the GLD in this case. If you look at the uh, November low, really September, October, November, all lows around 151 for the GLD. You can see how things changed in November. Look at how the momentum shifted from a bearish phase to more of a bullish phase as we have this green shaded area. Recently, we reached up to around 182 and then pulled back. We have gone below the 50-day moving average, which does not make me feel good about it. However, the RSI for now appears to be holding right around 40, which is more characteristic of a bull market phase. We're now bouncing potentially right off of 170. That is a 38.2% retracement of the September low to the January, February high. This might be a really opportune time for this bounce to happen and gold going higher. I think stocks coming down while gold rallies is a potential narrative to keep in your mind uh, going into next week. Finally, Enphase Energy. This is in a group called Renewable Energy Equipment. It has solar stocks and some hydrogen names and others. 
But uh, Enphase Energy is uh, is one of those. Uh, actually, on my latest YouTube video, where I was talking about NVIDIA and talking about a bullish momentum divergence. Uh, uh, someone actually put in the comments this chart of Enphase and pointed out that this is a bullish momentum divergence as well. 100% agreed. If you look at the closes over the last couple months, we can see lower closes January into February. You can see higher lows in the momentum. So when you have that condition where the price is going lower, but the momentum is actually sloping higher, bullish momentum divergence, that indicates a likely scenario where the downside momentum has exhausted, potentially buyers coming in, pushing it to a uh, new highs. Watch end phase in the coming weeks, folks. That's it. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Again, it's a pleasure to do this show for you. Have a great long holiday weekend. Don't forget about our Monday special episode focused on this chart list feature on StockCharts.com. All of our previous interviews can be found at StockCharts.com. Sorry, StockCharts.tv.com. For StockCharts in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, be safe. We'll see you next week. Dave Keller here with StockCharts.com. Thanks so much for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, and we hope you did, hit the like button right below. Also, we have so much new content every day. Consider subscribing to the channel. Just hit the subscribe button in the video or right below. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Have a fantastic day.